Anyone who believes that words don't hurt or have an impact probably hasn't seen the effect two words can have on a room full of straight, white, cis men. <laughs> Diversity and inclusion. So forget nuts, forget gluten. The new allergy in town that's growing at a really rapid rate is DNI intolerance. And for those who suffer from DNI intolerance, they don't even need to touch a diversity and inclusion policy. Simply being within earshot of one being discussed is enough for symptoms to run rampant. The hands get clammy, they start to twitch, their throats get dry, some break out in hives. There have even been an increasing number of fits reported, usually of the hissy variety. <laughs> but hey, fits nonetheless. As an Arab woman working in mainstream media in Australia and the first to work in commercial television news, I've seen my fair share of these episodes. One time I was told, it is impossible as a white man to get promoted because of tokenism. And, and this was said to me by a man who was already in a pretty senior editorial role. And it was at a time when, yes, there were some like vague murmurs about the need for more representation, but no actual policies in place. That was enough for him to feel that he was now the victim. So I did a little bit of Google and LinkedIn stalking. I'm like a pro at Google stalking. Um, and I found out that since that discussion, he's been promoted not once, but twice. And at the time of our chat, academic research that I was part of with four universities and Media Diversity Australia found that every single television news director in the country was a white man. But forget the media and looking at corporate Australia, it looks as though only white people get promoted because ASX 300 board directors, only 5% are not white. And this is in a country where a quarter of us were born overseas. Half of us have a parent who were born overseas. And the three most common countries of birth outside of Australia are England, India, and China. White people being discriminated against? No. Nah. It flies in the face of evidence. So if it's not actually happening, where is this fear of reverse discrimination coming from? Because there have been countless studies in countless countries. In fact, a summary of all the research findings in all of these countries came to the same conclusion, that if your name is, say, Andrew, Peter or John, and I suspect there are a few of you here today, <laughs> you are far more likely to be hired than, say, someone called Viraj or Wang, even if your qualifications are identical. So affirmative action policies, like targets or quotas, cannot be put in the same basket as decades of discrimination that's been enshrined in policy and laws since colonization. And by their very design, they were designed to keep black people down and brown people out. So in 1989, American academic and feminist Peggy McIntosh tried to put her finger on the invisible ways in which she was privileged as a white woman. And she came up with this 50-point essay. And it included a range of things, like if she was to flick on the television, she could be confident that she would see somebody who looked like her. Or if she walked into any, any organization and was like, I want to speak to the person in charge, she would know that she'd face somebody of her race. And for her, this was this really important realization as to how racism or discrimination manifests. And it was less about individual acts of violence or cruelness, and more about a series of systems, invisible systems and structures that give benefit and dominance to one race over another. And so, yes, over the past decade or so, diversity and inclusion has gained momentum. You've heard a lot about it, you've probably rolled your eyes about it, and in part, it seeks to address this entrenched inequity. And recently, a corporate CEO, he came up to me and he said, oh, Antoinette, I understand the need for diversity and inclusion. Theoretically, I get it. It's better for social cohesion. I understand the business imperative. It's better for business. But I'm getting this pushback from my staff. They're saying things to me like, oh, well, that gesture is just tokenistic. And why did you hire that person? How come I couldn't apply for that role? That's just reverse discrimination. So there are those two concepts again. Reverse discrimination, 
tokenism. Now, tokenism, that I have a problem with, and we're going to get back to it in just a moment. But reverse discrimination doesn't exist. It's a misnomer. It's a false equivalence. So I recently published my first book, um, which is very exciting. Um, and it, it's essentially a toolkit um, on diversity and inclusion and how to be an anti-racism ally. And I decided to disprove all the kids at school who always like, said to me, oh, you're never going to be anything more than an un, you know, unpopular nerd, Antoinette. And so my book's called How to Lose Friends and Influence White People. <laughs> Showed them. Uh, and about a month after its release, here's me at a bookstore. I'm quietly and discreetly re-merchandising because I saw my book was like in the back aisle near the fire hydrant and I was putting it towards the front. But don't judge me because all authors do it, I'm just admitting to it. And I saw this woman and she was holding my book and she was this well-dressed, middle-aged white woman and I was like, oh my God, I have a fan. And I was so excited. She caught my eye, she was smiling. It was this really beautiful moment. And then she comes up to me and says, uh, excuse me, do you sell bookmarks at the counter? <laughs> so um, I'm not as well known as I thought. Um, but I took the opportunity to tell her that no, I'm not a staff member. I wrote the book that she's holding and I asked her why she picked it up. And she said that she has family that lives all over the world, they're in interracial marriages, and she wanted to know how to have better conversations about race. And I was like, amazing, I'm nailing it. This is just the sort of person we need to be an ally and do the work. But then she continued. <laughs> that it was especially important because of her white South African grandson. And that he had recently left South Africa and moved to North Europe to escape all of that ghastly reverse discrimination that was impacting him. And I'm like, Ugh on the inside. I almost snatched the book off her, but let's be honest, a sale's a sale. <laughs> so before I had a chance to respond, she, she, she starts to elaborate and says, you know, there, there are science scholarships designed specifically for black South African females, and that is unfair on my grandson. And at the local sporting club, that there were racial quotas, and that it was all of that tokenistic stuff that was disadvantaging white people. Oh, deep breaths, Antoinette, deep breaths. Okay, there is one thing I agree with this woman about, and it's that tokenism sucks. It doesn't benefit anybody. So tokenism is a hasty or half-hearted gesture to give the appearance of diversity and inclusion, to give the appearance of caring, but it doesn't actually lead to shifts in power. It doesn't actually change people's perceptions and views. If anything, it makes them double down or makes them worse. Because when something is tokenistic, it generally leads to more discrimination and more hostility. And somebody like me, who was apparently benefiting and getting a leg up from diversity and inclusion, it usually makes diverse people less likely to put themselves forward, less likely uh, to, to actually back themselves, and more likely to wonder if they belong in the first place. So diversity and inclusion, or when it's tokenism, it's diversity and inclusion done badly. It's giving diversity and inclusion a bad rap. So I want the record to note that nobody benefits from tokenism. Not somebody like me, not the 60-year-old white bloke on the golf course speaking to his all-male boardroom mates, complaining about the fact that he heard murmurs that they were going to hire a woman to join the board and saying things to his mates like, well, the best person to get the job, you know, maybe she should just work harder. You know, all of, I mean, that all, anybody who holds those views just sounds like a minion to me because it's just like incomprehensible and it's been debunked so widely. So they don't benefit, but certainly not those said women who then get thrust into that boardroom in a culturally unsafe and hostile place and are expected to thrive. So the grandmother and I, we agree about tokenism, but her views on reverse discrimination are, how can I eloquently put this? Like, just horse shit. For the love of Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Yahweh, and white women in expensive activewear who recently converted to yoga. <laughs> Taking steps to address entrenched inequities is not akin to reverse discrimination. 
Real discrimination has been enshrined in our laws and in our policies since colonisation, and it continues to impact black and brown people's lives. Our health outcomes, our, edu our education opportunities, our overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, and crucially, our access to power and a fair go. These are the ways that discrimination manifests, not because the woman's grandson wasn't considered for a science scholarship designed for black female students in South Africa. I understand that on an individual level, it can feel, you can feel a bit aggrieved, you can feel let down, you can feel a bit pissed off. Like, I would have really liked to have applied for that role. I think I would have, really, would have been really ace at that job. But the change that is required to shift these systemic inequities, it's not individual. It's not about hurt feelings. Because if you are white, or straight, able-bodied, male, or crucially all of the above, you are not being punished by diversity and inclusion strategies. <laughs> if you don't believe me, like a Venn diagram, or like Shakira's hips, Venn diagrams don't lie. <laughs> These policies simply seek to address the inequality slippery slope, because if one person has a paper cut, and another person has cancer, you don't just give both people a Band-Aid. For black and indigenous women, this slope is more like Canada's Mount Thor. It's almost a vertical cliff, and that's why different paths are required for different people to essentially get them to the same destination. So paths that are equal, equitable and fair don't actually allow people to arrive at the same destination, and accepting this is step one. But many people refuse to take this first step, and they instead choose to defend the status quo. That's probably because from their vantage point, things look pretty good. It's also probably because from their position, the system is currently working for them. But if you still can't get your head around why different journeys are required for different people, and why journeys that are equal, equitable and fair are not just three ways of saying the same thing, let's take a trip to the local supermarket. So it's grocery shopping day, this time you remembered your shopping trolley token. You come to insert it, but it doesn't work. You try a few more trolleys, still no luck. But it just so happens that one in four tokens in this trolley token distribution system is flawed, it doesn't work. This is not an equal shopping society, because no matter how much you hammer fist and cuss and try and get that token to work, you've just got a dud token. Meanwhile, others around you insert, unlatch with ease, kind of look back at you smugly, and off they go. But if the supermarket wanted to make things more equitable, they could send an employee out to the front with replacement tokens. But should everybody get a new token, even those if their token was working in the first place? No, right? And then they could up the ante a little bit more, and that would include removing the barrier entirely, and so that's providing shopping trolleys with no tokens. The barrier is removed. This is a fair shopping society. But ironically, it's fairness that is often touted in opposition to diversity and inclusion policies. But there is nothing fair about steep slopes or dodgy tokens for some and cruisy paths for others. For migrant and refugee women in Australia, they're overrepresented in part-time and precarious service industry work. And a 2018 Australian Institute of Family Studies report found that women who have these roles and are in domestic violence situations, they are far less likely to reach out for help. And the unstable, precarious nature of their work is part of the reason why. So the impact of work workplace inequity is far beyond just the workplace and permeates through society. But let's go back to the supermarket for just a moment, because getting into the supermarket is one part, that's the diversity part, but inclusion is what happens when you get in. Are you able to thrive and grow, bring your whole self? Are you encouraged, supported, cultivated? Because when both the diversity and inclusion part are done well, this is when everybody benefits, because diverse organisations they're more innovative than their competitors. They're better at identifying risk. Recent research from Deloitte also showed that they outperform their less diverse competitors by 35%. Representation builds bridges, it builds trust, it yields results. I cannot tell you the amount of times as a journo 
who grew up in Western Sydney with a working class Arabic speaking background, that I was able to get angles or scoops or exclusives because people felt more comfortable speaking to somebody who looked and sounded like them. And on the one hand, I kind of want to put it down to the fact that, oh, I'm pretty awesome and that's why they want to work with me. Maybe it's a little bit of that, um, but it's more social science. It's not rocket science. And when there isn't trust and representation, the impacts can be pretty catastrophic. Who can forget Sydney's lockdowns and the LGAs of concern, the red zone hotspots, where half of the city was treated like it was in a supermax prison and the other half went to the beach? When monolithic leaders choose to demonize and ostracize our most diverse and vulnerable communities, public health messages don't cut through. Trust in institutions are lost. And the impact was pretty profound. Australians born in the Middle East were 10 times more likely to die from COVID. Now, this is a shocking statistic, but it's not surprising because trust was obliterated. So if I had my chance to pick my jaw off the ground, go back to the bookstore and pick up that conversation with the woman worried about her grandson, here is what I would say. Your grandson is not being punished by diversity and inclusion policies. He's not missing out on opportunities. It's just ensuring that those communities and those groups that have long been denied access to a fair go finally get a chance. And at this point, I'm imagining there's like a bit of a crowd and people are watching. And so then I'm like walking up the book aisle. Because when we enter this world, we don't get a choice about the color of our skin, our gender, our sexuality, our geography. And given the flawed trolley token distribution system that permeates our society, I'd stop here, I'd turn. <laughs> you should understand your power and privilege if you have a working token. So don't be a barrier to change. Don't turn your back on inclusion because the change that is needed to shift and challenge entrenched inequity it's not individual, it's not about your hurt feelings, it's systemic, it's far bigger than you, and it most certainly is not reverse discrimination. And then I would take a bow. <laughs>